Hey everybody, welcome to the Fired Up with CJ Show. We have Ian Baker here talking about his book, Tibetan Yoga, Principles and Practices. And the first segment we were talking about embodiment. And in that section, you were talking about how, you know, part of being embodied is to be connecting to the world around us. So, um, the elements, the trees, the people, and, and part of the idea of Tantra is to be, um, I, I, correct me if I'm wrong, is to basically um, see the divine here on earth. And so when we're connecting with our loved ones or a tree or the weather, it's actually, it's all one and the same thing. Um, and that's one of the benefits, I think, of em, embodiment. Um I, did I get that right? <laughs> did I miss anything? Absolutely. No, absolutely. This is, as you said, it's really about, um, you know, a path of integration as opposed to, let's say, the early Buddhist vision, which was about renunciation. What the tantric Buddhist tradition brought in was a guy of transforming experience rather than actually having to renounce or reject our, our sensual experience in the world. We We transform it by bringing a kind of higher vision of wisdom and compassion into all aspects of our life. So it's really a path ultimately of, of integration where we're bringing again the body and the mind, the sensual and the spiritual all become, as you were putting it, sort of part of this sort of this oneness. And the same is true of all those, you know, in our life experience, you know, both the human and even, you know, the non-human environment is all part of us. Um, and there's nothing in that sense to be rejected, but everything to be kind of embraced and integrated and to become part of an awakening journey. That's certainly the, the ideal behind the, the Tibetan tantric vision of life. All right. So I, I'm going to share a little bit about my own personal practice, Please. which uh -huh. um, started with a tantric Shaivism practice um, and then actually probably started with some type of chulkar, not even intending to do that and spontaneous movements just showing up on my meditation and not knowing what the heck was happening. Then going to a tantric Shaivism practice, a Kundalini yoga. So not the Tibetan form, but the Indian, um, maybe some of the original parts of it. And then um, now I'm kind of going and then I have also touched upon shamanism. So I've, I've done all these things in not necessarily progression order, or maybe not even in logical sense. However, I've still done all these things. And so the element practice that I've been doing recently has been um, looking at the healing aspect of the elements and how they relate, the five elements, how they relate to our physical body and that it's all holonomic. So what's out there in the universe is actually inside of our body. So, um, mm -hmm. you know, my, my liver, my spleen, my, you know, my lungs, my heart, it's all or oriented towards the world out there. And then using various um, practices that relate to something you touched upon before, a deity yoga. So I'd be connecting to um, the water goddess and merging with the water goddess um, in a formal practice and asking the water goddess to um, merge with me and then bring back elements that I've lost in my past and bring it back into my elements and then to, um, at the third part, bring those elements into my central channel, moving from gross, you know, out, uh, material things to this esoteric, which I think you refer to as in external, internal, and secret. I think that's, a, I, I think that's exactly the same, but I, I'm doing this practice. Um, my sense about this practice is I have more connection at just even doing this meditation, but even I go outside and I'm looking at the lake that I walk around and I'm tuning in and feeling the lake within me informally. So this is a practice that I've been doing. Tell me a little bit. So I think one of the problems with a lot of these westernized versions of these classes is, you know, I'm taking one week class and like, oh, I'm the expert now. And I realize I know nothing about 
the element practices, but I was wondering at a high level if you can tell me a little bit about what is the intention of these practices, where do they come from historically, and how they integrate with the other practices. Sure. Well, the five elements, as you as you refer to them, are something that's shared between these traditions, uh, whether it's Tantric Buddhism, whether it's Tantric Shaivism, Taoism, you know, Indian Ayurveda, all of these are looking at, and we have it also in our, on our Western Greek tradition of the elements. Uh, we, you know, we have earth, water, fire, air, and space or consciousness as it was understood in the, um, uh, originally, but, uh, you know, we sort of lost the fifth element in, in the Western tradition. But earth, water, fire, and air, as we understand them, are, were the original constituents of, of, um, of reality, uh, both external, the external elements as well as the elements in our body. So that's, it's not really an esoteric um, concept in the sense that we can relate to the earth element, meaning our flesh, our bones, the, the water element, meaning the fluids, the, whether the lymph, the blood, uh, the circulation, the water, of course, which is, you refer to that inner lake because, you know, we're 70% or so water anyway and the fire meaning that metabolic heat in which sort of keeps everything going and then the air being this just this natural sense of of, of motion and um and fluidity um and then the space or the consciousness and uh representing that that fifth element so these are all things we work with, let's say in the tantric Buddhist tradition. Um, I mean there's one actual sort of aphorism, if you will, for basically meditation, and it's sort of the highest levels, they say, you know, you keep, you know, your body should be like a mountain, in other words, like the earth, mm -hmm. and your, your, um, your breath should be like the ocean, in a sense, just this natural, you know, just imagine sort of waves coming up against a beach or shore, you know, the natural ebb and flow, and the mind should be like the sky or space. So we've already sort of integrated three of the elements that way. Um, and then the, the fire is that sort of the creativity, the inner inspiration uh, that animates all of this. So it's a, so the elements in this sense are a way of connecting to, on the external level, to nature and all of its multiple dimensions, looking at these processes. Uh, but we also recognize them as being, you know, intrinsic, just like the microcosm and macrocosm, that these two are, they're not separate. So that the elements of our own being are also reflected externally whether they're in for example the lake that you say you know that you kind of communion commune with or the trees or the earth or the rocks all of these things are things that we work with um dynamically um yes. as a way of going deeper into our own nature and nature itself so i think you saw there's an image in the book for example just to give one i think pointed example of the, uh, there's it's a pairing of a see if I have it here of um, it's on it it's on the wall of the six Dalai Lama's uh, meditation chamber in the 1600s of a uh, someone meditating at a waterfall like this image here for example oh uh, yes and you know what we see in that is um, this is a meditation using the sound of the element of water to be able to go into a transpersonal state of consciousness, really a shamanic state of consciousness. And then, you know, it's paired with, with a contemporary practitioner, you know, in, in Bhutan, a woman practicing that. And this is a way of using the elements of nature in order to, to contact those, that state of fluidity uh, within our own being. You know, sometimes it might be we connect through meditation with that groundedness, the earth element. But there's also this sense of the fluidity, the movement uh, and flow that the water element is signifying in this case, or the connectivity that the water element represents. Mm -hmm. And then there's the fire, which is the, you know, the creativity, the inspiration, you know, the fire of life. And then that spaciousness, that air, the movement, the, the motility, if you will. Mm -hmm. um, so these are all, they're, they're metaphors. And as you said, they kind of, we find them in all of these different traditions. Um, because they are the elements of our experience. Um, and they are the elements that we can see, you know, in, in the rocks, the trees, the air, the, um, 
the sunlight. Um, they are opportunities uh, to to work with that um, integration between yeah the the forces within us or the energies and within us and those in the external environment. You know, I, I'm, you know, it's funny because as you were describing, because you were saying it's in all religions and um, I was in the Camino, I'm not um, Catholic, but in all of the rituals they have, you know, they have the holy water, they have the lights. I mean, there's this whole ritualistic aspect in, in you know, all this stuff is felt served in chalices, you know, that are, so they all have these elemental aspects that, I, I, I wonder whether whether people even recognize that all these different rituals are hearkening back to probably the creation of Earth itself, right? Where all these, and I don't know, is that is that what they're meant to be? Because I'm not Catholic, and you've studied this stuff. Is that what some of those rituals would look like in... Yeah, I don't know if they're even consciously evoking that, um, but I think, certainly, I think it's just almost instinctual. I mean, in a certain sense, we can't escape the five elements, they are actually the reality that we exist within, you know, whether it's the fluidity, the fire, the, you know, earth, water, fire, air, and space, they are, in a sense, that's, that's, they circulate within us, uh, and certain ones are, you know, they become out of balance. We see in Ayurvedic medicine, for example, they talk about the balance of these internal elements. I mean, that's often referred to as vata, pitta, kapha, sort of air element or phlegm, which is, um, and, uh, you know, the kapha can be much more the sort of the groundedness. And these have both positive aspects. And you can say if they come out of balance, then they, you know, you can be excessively grounded or you can be excessively kind of air element and all over the place. So it's about just bringing a sense of internal order and harmony between these different qualities that we kind of metaphorically refer to as being elements of earth, water, fire, air, and space, but are really referring to psychological uh, or physio-psychological processes, you could say. Yeah, I mean, I've, I've been finding this amazing. So, you know, I and I'm not even sure to what extent the stuff that I'm learning is like grounded in spiritual texts. I think some of them are, but they've moved it to Okay, there are certain colors that are associated with the elements. There's um, emotional responses. So I'll just continue with the idea of water is the idea of um, on the positive. There's like scales of positive representations of that archetype water, which would be calm, peaceful, flowing. Mm -hmm. And the opposite, which is, you know, I think it's fear. I think, yeah, fear is one of those. Fear is the main one that I can come up with, but those are kind of the, um, you know, fear out of control, you know, all the different things you can actually think about with water and down to like landscapes to, because it's, it's because it's one of the core aspects that everything is built from that it goes down from the, colors to the as you said psychological to physical organs that it's related to i mean it has this whole uh, yeah whole spectrum spectrum and it's like the most i've studied um different psychological um personality tests this to me is like the original (laughs) the original personality (laughs) test and Uh and system um and what I found, at least personally, is like tuning, as I'm tuning into how um, COVID has ha- has made me depleted of a sense of stability like a mountain or mm-hmm. the mm-hmm. breath, that the, my breathing has actually literally been affected during this whole time. I can see that those things are out of balance and how I can bring you know, more of those elements into my life or, you know, use other elements to compensate. I mean, it's, it's a very interesting practice. It's super practical and it does connect me to those elements within myself and in its daily expression. And, and it also has made me more connected. Like when I'm walking and I feel the wind in Mm -hmm. the air, I'm connected to those things. So what, what, what is the, actual intention of these practices um, in terms of why, you know, why were these practices introduced? Yeah. 
so when we look at early Buddhism, um, these five elements um, of experience, really, we can refer to them that way, but these were what people experienced when they went into the, you know, the world around them. They, experienced, they saw there was earth, you know, there was the wind in the trees, there was the water, there was the sunlight, fire, there was the sky, there was the space, the air. So all of these were basically, and meditation, if we look at it in the early Buddhist iteration, was it was done in nature. You know, it wasn't done in monasteries. People sat under trees. And all of these things were, were in a natural harmony. There was a kind of, there was a kind of innately, you could say, ecological awareness of the, of the innate harmony between the elements. And so meditation was in part, and certainly by the time of the Tantras, when these five elements and they're associated with different colors or associated with different kind of yogini forms, the dance, the dance of the elements was really about bringing, recognizing these and then uh, emphasizing those elements uh, in one's own constitution in one's own psychology that to bring you into balance because we can see so easily a kind of um, psychological component we, we just in the same way we can refer to someone as being earthy we can refer to someone as being they're a little bit watery they're you know a little bit fluid or they're a little bit fight they're fiery or they're airy a little bit spacey so in a certain sense there's a natural way in which we can use these the elements just as a way of defining a, a personality type and that has both of you know to talk about someone being very fiery that's that can be very exciting and stimulating but it can also mean that they're prone to anger and you know kind of so it's about just bringing element just bringing a natural balance into these states and i think it's really just these are yeah just in the way that we use those terms in Kind of just vernacular uh, speech, you know, about someone being earthy, watery, fiery, or or uh, airy, <laughs> spacey. Um, you know, it's it's a way of understanding ourselves too, and where we're feeling, you know, where we need a little bit more grounding, or where we need a little bit more spaciousness in our thoughts because we're feeling too hemmed in by our thoughts and emotions, and we're a little bit kind of heavy. Um, and maybe a little bit in that sense, excessively too much earth element mm -hmm. it becomes phlegmatic. It becomes something that kind of just holds us back. There's no more movement in it. Right. So in that sense of, you know, the body, like a mountain, the breath, you know, and the eyes like the ocean and the mind, like the sky, this is, this is in a certain sense on a, you know, using, uh, and it, it's an, it, it's an integral vision of, a, of a harmonious relationship of body, breath and mind, you could mm -hmm. say. And did it evolve because, you know, so it's a, a lot of these um, sh shamanic practices, whether it's here, like Native American, they all evolved from like understanding these elements because they were living in these elements. It, the, it's like life or death sense of like whether it rains or not is going to mean crops or not. Um, so is that how it evolved into what was the next part or is it an integrative and then an evolutionary aspect or, or do you view these things as separate? Well, I think, as you say, these are the five elements are integral to, to all cultures because they are the elements of nature. And they are, that means they're also the elements within our own psychophysical being and they're connected with the organs and let's say in Taoist traditions and they're associated with the kind of, the five, you know, the three humors in in Ayurvedic thought, and so they have, you know, they're 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 relevant. They're just ways in which, um, and the shamanic uh, practices, for example, we also work with particular. They also become. There's a portal in a certain sense. You know, we use the earth. You know, there's the tunnel in the earth. There's the you know, which is in a sense can be also correlated with the central channel in some of the more esoteric Kundalini yogas, for example, where we're trying to bring all of the these uh, energies into a kind of transpersonal core within our with our own being that in a certain sense has its counterpart, one could argue, in the kind of core shamanic practice of finding that sort of as it were, a portal or a tunnel into non-ordinary reality, mm -hmm. uh, the shamanic dimension of which is a state um, 
I think, you know, as is often referred to, non-ordinary reality. It's this reality, but it's another dimension of it. It's, you know, it's the equivalent of the subconscious or the unconscious having been made conscious through a certain technique, whether it's shamanic drumming, whether it's visualization, whether it's rapid breathing, all of these are, you know, techniques um, that depending on our own disposition or capacity that we can use in order to connect with, I think, those deeper levels of our of our being yeah uh, really what it's all about it's not about you know escaping this you know the earthly dimension for a spiritual world it's about connecting you know more deeply to what our human body uh, in its deeply embodied sense offers us as a vehicle for expanded states of awareness mm -hmm. because all those states of awareness they're you know whether we understand them as being connected with the brain or connected with the heart we we know that it's, you know, it's not either or, you know, the, where this is this embodied consciousness that, you know, with, with neuroscience, it's always looking at what's happening in the brain, but there's all kinds of things happening, as any neuroscientist will tell you, you know, simultaneously things are happening in the heart, or they're happening everywhere, but in the endocrine system, and not just in the, you know, brain circuitry, but it's, they don't, there's the equipment that's, you know, better suited to, to measuring what's happening, brain waves, than it is to, you know, these kind of endocrinal responses, which are actually much more associated with the, you know, which is what I guess, you know, you were referring to in the, initially in this, like, these practices such as tumo, uh, and the, the inner fire, which are bringing about states of bliss, uh, states of transpersonal joy. Um, and those, in a sense, are, are connected very much with other Mm. part of the body than just the brain you know we feel mm. that in the heart we feel that in our you know it's a very these are em embodied uh states right. that have their own healing they 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 heal trauma you know this bliss can be very it's not just a form of escapism it can be very very healing mm. okay i want to um so we've been talking to um ian baker about his book tibetan yoga and we've been talking about the element practices they're kind of origins or intent. And I wanted to go next to the Sao Long practices and find out a little bit about their origins or intent and um, what they may even look like. I have some, my own sense of what they may be, but would like to yeah. talk generally what they mean. So thank you so much. Pleasure.